Welcome everybody. We are just delighted that you are all able to join us this evening. My name is Fran Casey and I'm the Director of Community Relations here at DePaul University. This is the Lincoln Park Community Research Initiatives Spring Program. It is our 26th program. We began in 1998 during DePaul's centennial year and our purpose was to collect and document and celebrate the shared history that DePaul University has had with you, the Lincoln Park community, for now the last 115 years, which we think is pretty remarkable. To highlight the fact that we have the Lincoln Park collection in our university library archive, we hold these programs twice a year that focus on some aspect of life in Lincoln Park. Tonight's program, Menus for Success, Lincoln Park's Timeless Restaurants, is going to sort of tell the story of how these five pivotal restaurants contributed to the history and the development of Lincoln Park. And they have, because as you all know, I'm sure, some of these restaurants when they began, well, Paul Tuesday, Twin Anchors was in 1932, 32, uh, but the others, were critical in the development of Lincoln Park, the rebirth of Lincoln Park in the 60s and early 70s. So let me introduce you to our panelists from five of these restaurants. The first is John Barleycorn. John Barleycorn was established in 1963 and is represented by Sam Sanchez. Right here. The second is the Chicago Pizza and Oven Grinder Company which was established in 1972 and is represented tonight by Kathy Gavanis. The third is Gehaz, established in 1965 and represented by Jeff Lawler. The fourth is R.J. Grumps, which was established in 1971 and we are very excited that we have Rich Mellon with us tonight who began the entire Let Us Entertain You enterprise and is still going strong with all kinds of new ideas I'm hearing. So, and the fifth is our honorable, most established restaurant and that is Twin Acres, represented by Paul Tuzzi, um, who is as part of the original family, I believe Paul, that started Twin Acres, but you'll hear that story in a little, in a little and now for tonight's moderator. We are so honored and thrilled that we have Steve Jelinski from ABC7 News here in Chicago. Steve is known as the Hungry Hound. He is the food reporter for ABC7 News. But in addition to that, um, well, I should say first he came, I thought it was 1995, but I was wrong. He came to Chicago in 1992 from St. Cloud, Minnesota, where he began his career as executive producer of CLTV's Good Eating Show. He did that for eight years. Uh, he's also a food contributor and reporter for WBEZ. And during that time since he arrived, he has won 12 James Beard Awards for his reporting, which I think is pretty impressive. <laughs> And in his spare time, he founded the Culinary Communications Organization, a media training and consulting business for chefs and other food professionals. And so, with that, I'm going to turn this program over to Steve Jelinski. Thank you very much. And you can all hear me because I can hear that feedback. Welcome, all of you. Uh, this is, uh, is going to be fun, and I'm, I'm honored that uh, the organization asked me to be here tonight because I have been focusing on restaurants exclusively in Chicago since '95, uh, doing the Good Eating Show uh, for CLTV every week, and then about almost exactly 10 years ago, started at ABC, and um, we now do four stories a week at ABC. For those of you who don't know, I'm on Wednesdays and Fridays at 11 a.m., and Fridays and Saturdays at 10 p.m., and it's just been a fantastic station to be at. And of course, Chicago has just become this incredible food town that we all love and cherish. And I think the great thing about tonight is that you know, I thought the subheading should be the, uh, the Cherished Memories panel because so many people here have great memories in these restaurants, whether it was makeups or breakups or engagements or 
you know, all kinds of special occasions. So it's, uh, it's going to be great to hear these stories as well. So uh, Frank introduced everybody, so we know who our panelists are. And we've got about oh, 45 minutes where I'm going to kind of lead the discussion. And then we're going to open it up for questions at about 7.45. So definitely have some questions ready if you would like to ask any of the folks up here. Um, I thought... I thought the first thing to do is just to kind of lay the groundwork for these restaurants. And kind of, if you haven't been, is it, by the way, has, has everybody here been to most of these restaurants? Yeah? Oh, wow, okay. So these are your locals, folks, up here. Um, I think it would be good to hear the story, though, because, you know, we know these restaurants are legendary. And by the way, the criteria, I'm told, was they had to be at least 30 years old. That was kind of the starting point. So these are all at least 30 years um, in business. And I thought we should start with. Um, our, uh, our senior member here, um, our oldest restaurant, restaurant tour, or at least restaurant business, and I'm sure Rich Melman hears this a lot of the time. But Rich, you're the young guy here, you're the kid, so we're not going to start with you. We're going to start with we're going to start with Twin Acres, 1932. Now I know Paul Tusi wasn't around in 32, running the restaurant. You've been your family's been running this for about 35 years. But um, can you tell us a little bit about Twin Acres, kind of how it got its start, and um, what has made it so so successful these years? Well, Twin got to start um, it, it, in, in the location uh, that Twin Acres is still uh, operating in. Uh, there was a speakeasy called Tanty Lee Soft Drinks, operated during Prohibition. And two fellows named uh, Bob Walters and uh, Captain Herb Elkin, who was the harbor master of the Road Harbor, purchased the place in 1932 when, and actually, ran it as a speakeasy for about a year and a half. Then um, when Prohibition was repealed, they named it Twin Acres, the name coming from the uh, fact that, uh, from the Harbor Master, from the uh, Captain Murray. And uh, it was uh, you know, pretty much just a, a local quarter bar, as, which were all over the place in uh, Chicago. Uh, if you look back in the uh, listings of uh, um, businesses back then, uh, if you look under saloons, it just went on from pages and pages uh, of the saloons that were back at that time in the city. Um, and it uh, didn't actually become a quote-unquote restaurant until a little bit later when uh, Bob Walter's wife, uh, Walter's lived upstairs, and she started preparing meals, uh, preparing food, fried chicken, tacos, various things, and bringing it downstairs for the uh, the people drinkings uh, as a little treat or maybe to sober them up or whatever the case may be. And one of her uh, dishes uh, really became the most popular, that was her barbecue ribs. So that went from being just something that she would make on occasion on a Sunday to something that she would make all the time to something that they actually started selling on a regular basis and that's kind of how it turned into a restaurant. Okay. Um, I guess the next oldest would be probably Barley Corn, which was in the 60s, Sam. I know, again, you didn't own it in the early 60s, but um, it took, my research shows that the building is, goes back to 1890. And by the way, Barley Corn is at um, 658 West Belden, correct? The first one. That's what we're talking about. So, building from 1890, and I'm guessing it was a speakeasy? That's kind of my understanding? Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry. All right. uh, actually, yes, uh, the building where uh, the home shop probably corn uh, was a speakeasy. It was uh, built in uh, 1890, and uh, tin ceilings are still there originally from the 1890 on the front part of the, of the restaurant. Um, the building, I mean, still stands on uh, the limestone foundations originally. I mean, we did some modifications, you know, throughout the years. We did some changes, but uh, throughout the years, the windows were painted by five different colors by the time I got to it myself in 92. But um, throughout the years, it was sort of a speakeasy. But in 1963, Mr. Eric Bankhill decided to open a John Brownley Corn. And he only had a couple items on the menu. And one of the items is uh, the half pound burger, which we still buy from the same provider and still serve it. And that's the one thing that Eric Bankhill started right, and we make sure we kept it. Uh, the collection of the ships around the wall, which has been our boutique, and all the, all the, the, the chain of John Brown that we have now, there's four of them. Uh, there was one collected by Mr. Mr. Van Gelder throughout the years. Uh, the establishment was purchased in 1985 by my family, 
and I started working there in 98. I was given the greatest opportunity to be part of uh, John Barley Point. And in 92, they took over ownership. So I made my goal that if every time we open uh, John Barley Point, I would remove one of the good luck ships that uh, lined the wall, and we put them into one of our new establishments. And that is a symbol of our of our uh, uh, being unique. And always, always remember that where we came from, where we started. Uh, John Barley Point, I mean, also still played the classical music all the way until, let me see, 97, 98. We had the classical music, the, I used to clean, I used to, everybody remembers when he said there was a cat running around, and that's true, there was a cat running around back then. A lot of cats running around in the building. Uh, and Eric, and Eric, and Eric, and Eric, and Eric and loved the cat, so, uh, and uh, the art slides, the silent movies, we kept those all the way until about 98, 99. We did a little changes once we opened uh, our second job, another one at Wrigley and on Clark Street, and we realized that the times were changing, we had to change the time, so we had to run the, the new TVs, the sports, and but still we keep the model ship, we kept a couple of artifacts we found in the in the both sidewalk. Uh, and uh, we still have the collection of believe it or not, there's over seven thousand art slides that I still have at home. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. You talked a little bit about how you've adapted it, you've added a couple of things. I'm going to get to that after this, but hold that thought because that's, I think, an important point in terms of longevity. Our next oldest, 1965, Gehaz, which is at 340 West Armitage now, right by the Park West. But my understanding, Jeff Lawler, was that 65 to 71, the restaurant was on kind of a rough patch of, of wells. That is correct. Gehaz was created in uh, 1965 by John Davis. He had uh, attended and graduated from the University of Illinois and uh, went backpacking through Europe uh, for a number of months. There he fell in love with wine and cheese. And he came back to Chicago, had a daytime job. John was a cab driver. His father owned a cardboard company, but he always had a love for wine and cheese. He opened the first wine bar in the city of Chicago. And back in 65, when there was saloons with whiskey and beer flowing, it was very cutting edge for John to do an all-wine bar. And he loved it. He still worked his day job at um, the cardboard company, and at nights he would be at Gay Haas behind the bar. He's told me many, many stories about the staff and about the area. Six months after opening, he, there was a fire and it was destroyed about two thirds. So he had to rebuild and got to rebuilt. Enjoyed his time at 71. What is known now as Chicago's most romantic restaurant. Back then, he used to have an off duty police officer at the front door. <laughs> so people would not come in. John has told me stories where uh, he would have to go bail his staff out of jail so they would come and clean the dishes and clean up the place. A lot of wonderful stories. And it was in 71 when that area of Old Town was getting a little rougher. So he found the location we're at now. That building was also built in 1890, early 90s from some research that I did years ago. And it used to be a grocery store. He took what is now Gay Haas and two parts of it, he made the dining room and one party left as the grocery store and just for carrying the cheeses, the gourmet cheeses and wine. And then it went, the menu went through a lot of shifts in the early 70s to what it is to this day. And interesting, so this move happened in 71 and then three blocks away the same year, two guys decided to open up a restaurant uh, at 2056 North Lincoln Park West called RJ Grunts. And half of that team is Rich Melman who's here. The other half was Jerry Orzov, there's the RJ, and the grunts came from, you just like pig sounds? Is that the impetus? Jerry had a girlfriend. Jerry had a girlfriend. Jerry had a girlfriend whose nickname was Piggy. <laughs> He used to always joke, I mean, she had such an appetite, and she'd make these guttural sounds, but she'd throw on a cake, that's where it came from. 
See, the official press materials don't say that. The official press materials say they like the big sound. Or something. In fact, it was very funny. Uh, last week, my kids have a restaurant called Hub City, and I went into the restaurant to say hello to my oldest son. I've been out of town. And he was sitting with a young man that he's been friendly with. He's an actor from the West Coast. And his mother is peeking. <laughs> so when you, when you started this, what was the idea? It was going to be this fun, hip, 70s, kind of wacky, occasionally vegan, lots of burgers, but the salad bar. So how did it all come together? There were really three things, I think. I think initially it was the frustration of not being able to get my ideas out of the people that I worked with or for. I worked at a number of restaurants, I had all these ideas, and everybody thought they were silly, they weren't right. And the second thing was, and it's a long story, I'll make it very short, I, I met a man, I was younger, I was in my early 20s, and I, myself and my friend, a friend of mine, my best friend at the time, we put an ad in the Tribune that said, Inventions wanted will finance. And much to our surprise, we had a box. We had like 200 responses. And we narrowed it down. We, we thought we were these big business people. Between the two of us, we had like $3,000. He sold his sports car. But we thought we were real smart. We worked. And uh, we wound up narrowing it down to two people. And one, was a guy that worked middle management at the post office. And I remember we met him, we went out for lunch. And I remember I ordered um, spaghetti and meat sauce and mashed potatoes and gravy. It was downtown at like Henry's or someplace like that. And he went crazy, this guy. I just met him and was talking about how horrible I eat. 21 years old, so who cares? <laughs> anyway, he turned out to be a big influence. He wanted to make enough money by selling his inventions, and there were some interesting things that he had. So he could write about health and food, and how eating healthy makes a big difference in your life and in what becomes of you. And I found it fascinating, and I started hanging around with this guy. And he would take me to all these crazy places. I mean, you know, organic food was not in every grocery in those days. Well, so it was the frustration of not being able to do what I always thought I could do, not getting my ideas out there, meeting this man. And the third thing that tied it together was Jerry Orzov, who passed away in 1981. He was my best friend. Without him, I am certain that I could never have done what I've done. And somebody once, we were together one time, and they said, Richard's a restaurateur. I grew up in the restaurant business. What do you do? He said, look, Richard takes care of the restaurants, and I take care of Richard. <laughs> <laughs> and that was true. In every way, he was older than me, he was more he was smarter than me, he was more of a businessman than me more psychological than me. He was the most wonderful, guiding light of my life. And I am absolutely certain without Jerry Orzov, none of this would happen. And so that restaurant paved the way for this empire. Um, and I'm sure lots of people remember Fritz That's It and Lawrence of Oregano and John from Lisa Seagull. Seafood, excuse me. Um, but also many, many restaurants. I think more than 80 now uh, across the country that let us have this, correct? Well, we've done like 180 in our career, and we have 90 something. A lot of them are not under the lettuce banner. We have things on the West Coast. We have a lot of them. Sure. Okay. And then Kathy Galanis, uh, a year later, in 1972, Chicago Pizza and Oven Grinder opened up 2121 North Clark, again, right around the corner. These are all kind of in the same area. Uh, but the building itself goes way back. Um, I think one of the uh, significant things in its history was it was across the street in 1929 from the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Oh, and then it, there was a fire, and it was dormant, and then in 72, an attorney decided to open a restaurant there. It was Albert Beaver, and he, um, he 
fell in love with the building. I think you fell in love with the story of the building too. It was they say it was used as a lookout for Capone's men um, during the St. Valentine's Day massacre. It was like a, a not a very savory uh, boarding house at that time. And I think you fell in love with the story of the building, um, but it, it was pretty much gutted by a fire when he, he purchased it. So um, he um, rebuilt it, put all the wood that's in there now. And um, he came up with the idea of a pizza pot pie, which um, we still serve today. In fact, if you see the two menus on our table, nothing changes. And although there have been um, people who have adapted to change, and I think um, you opened up a few more restaurants. We <laughs> 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 have one, one uh, store, and uh, our menu has not changed. Nothing changed. I call it a time warp there. And um, although, you know, it's it's not, I don't think it's because we're lazy, it's just because it does take hard work to do things the same too. But it just has been a successful um, idea, the pizza pot pie, the oven grinder, and just the, the few things that we do have on the menu. Um, and we've just kept things the same. Okay, so this leads to my first big question for everybody. And just feel free to jump in here. Um, I'm just so curious, 40 years is kind of, you're the youngest one here, 40 years old, in terms of restaurant business. Uh, What's been the secret? Because I've seen a lot of restaurants come and go in Chicago over the last, I've lived here since 92, so the last 20 years I've seen a lot of places come and go, and yet you just keep plugging along, doing the same thing. Have you had to make changes to stay afloat? What's been like, one of the secrets? Anybody? For gay guys. <laughs> For gay guys. You can see back there where in the 70s, in the very early 70s, John opened the larger restaurant with a diverse menu. And he found that he had high food costs and things just weren't working out the way he thought. He just experienced a fondue and he was beginning to adapt some fondue into the menu. And he went full-fledged fondue. John and I have talked over the years. I wholeheartedly believe it. We've had a focused concept as being a wine and cheese and fondue restaurant. We didn't, don't try to be everything to everybody. We are who we are. We have served the highest quality possible. We have a very moderately price list, wine list. And our staff is highly trained, and motivated, and have a lot of fun. And we treat our guests as guests. And we treat everybody as if they're having a special occasion, and, and that's why it's probably grown into being such a special occasion restaurant and a focused restaurant. Anyone else? Well, there's probably a lot of different reasons why you stay relevant in terms of working with the public. I've often said I, I've never had a goal to be the biggest that might surprise some people, but I haven't. Or the richest, or even the most well-known. That's just not what I think about. I constantly think about doing the best job that I possibly can. And if the day that the day comes where I don't have the energy or the drive to be good at what I do, I probably retire. And I think it all boils down to caring. And I care passionately about what I do, what we do as a company. And there's a tremendous amount of pride. And we work very, very hard. There's still a, a healthy paranoia that I have. We're working at a restaurant that we're opening the 20th of this month. And I was there from 9 o'clock in the morning until I left to come here working on the small details, which I think are so important. And I often, often think that you have to be confident enough in life, if you want to be successful, to be flexible. I always think that people that are confident, they're often rigid. And I think part of the success that we've had is that we're flexible enough to change when we think we've made mistakes change because the 
every generation changes, and if you want to keep up with them, you must do that. And there's many, many other reasons, but these are some of the reasons, I think, that what we've done is work. Well, like for Paul, I'm curious because in the last year, Chicago has seen this explosion in barbecue restaurants. Everybody's doing low and slow and ribs and pulled pork, etc. Does that cause you to say we need we need to retrench, we need to do something different, or are you finding that the business isn't, hasn't been affected at all? You know what? I rarely. Look, well, I, I, I want Paul to answer this too. Sorry. No, I'm sorry, but I'm, only because Paul's been. They focus on ribs. Right? Really, that's your that's your bread and butter. Yeah, there's um, there, there's there's a big influx of uh, barbecue restaurants. There's a big influx of steakhouses, and you know, the, the, the certain trends maybe do come and go. Um, what we specifically are, I suppose, is we have always been a family operated business, which means that um, there, as Rich was alluding to, you know, there's, there's a lot of care involved. As uh, Jeff was alluding to, there's a lot of important focus. And um, I think for myself, I always think of it as uh, the, the success of Twin Acres, at least in what we've done in the last 30 years, is just understanding our DNA and making sure that we replicate it, keep it consistent, change things that need to be changed. We have more TVs than when we bought the place, when my folks bought the place 35 years ago, and it was just one hanging at the corner of the bar. Um, so changes are made, but uh, the core element of the business remains the same. And uh, as far as being concerned about other barbecue places opening up, um, I'm not really, you know, I'm certainly not frightened by that or, or worried or anything because uh, I, I hate to say it, but I mean, in 30, just in the 35 years that I've been involved in Twin Acres, I've seen some pretty good barbecue places kind of rise and fall in, in the city of Chicago. And not that I wish anybody any ill will that opens a place because I'd be the first to say it's a very tough job. But um, I think that, you know, as long as we keep doing what we're doing, we should, uh, we should have a uh, okay, a strong uh, segment of the barbecue market. So it sounds like we, between what you and Rich and Jeff are saying, the, the staff has got to be crucial here because to maintain, you know, to be flexible, to, to keep doing what you're doing, to understand your DNA, your staff has to be able to translate your vision. You can't be at every table every night on the floor, all of you, right? So is, does that mean keeping staff around a long time? They haven't turned over for any of you? Gay has, is, has been blessed with a wonderful staff. Uh, Mary, hopefully many of you met Mary back at the table. She's been with Gay House for 30 years now. We have a server working tonight that's been with Gay House for 31 years. Our average employee um, has probably been about 12 years at Gay House. And it's, it's just wonderful. They just care and, and a tribute to John. Um, he, he, has instilled quality, I've maintained and improved the quality over the years, the environment in which to work, and it's really produced in a wonderful staff. And it shows to the guys. Can you say something, Sam? I can turn it off, I'm sorry. Um, I think the, the John Brother, I'm going to keep the John Brother unique and continue with the changes. Uh, it has a lot to do with the atmosphere. Mr. Eric McGilder, when he first opened John Mulligan, provided an atmosphere that no one else had in Chicago with had a silent movie with the classical music. Also had uh, uh, people read poems. So that was an atmosphere that draw, draw the great clientele for many years. And the name John Mulligan just went on and went on and carried it. And, and, it, and as I traveled, I kept hearing people go, what about John Mulligan? And, and what we did to maintain it, we throughout the years, we did, we did change a little, but we always know that it took, took a lot of pride to maintain the same service, the quality of food, but it's always the atmosphere that, that developed around us and the people that enjoy and continue to come back. What we, what we continue to see is that uh, uh, I met many neighbors and customers uh, throughout the years that uh, brought their, that met their, met their spouse there, had their children, brought their children, uh, the children grew up there, 
Uh, their children end up working in Balakorn, met someone in Balakorn, married someone in Balakorn, their kids come here, and I could go on and on and on. And the, the most great has been to see that the, uh, what we provide is a family ambience. I know that at 10 o'clock at night it changes a little bit. We have to change it with time. You know, we change the time and uh, the pause, you know, the pause here, and the students want something, they want to see the sports, and, and we can rely on the sports. But the end has been a, a, a great part of the success of John Balakorn is always providing something that lasts for a long time. And I think that uh, following on the footsteps of my family and Mr. Eric Mangelder, who started John Barley Corn, and keeping that in mind that people wanted the atmosphere and enjoy the atmosphere, has continued to have John Barley Corn a successful place. So this might be the wrong question, but I was going to ask you how tastes changed over the years, because I don't see a lot of change on the menus. Like, you can't even just saying, you know, they want the same thing, it's consistent over and over. But I noticed like one little teeny tweak at the Twin Acres menu, you have you added a prohibition sauce in 2010. Right? So that that's a huge change for you, adding a little bit of a sauce. But I'm wondering if tastes change, and you can, any of you can address this. Change, change comes to Twin Acres at a glacier-like pace. Uh, 30, 30 years ago, my brother developed our second sauce, which was the zesty sauce. And it took you know, 28 years for there finally to be a, what we deemed a need to develop a third barbecue sauce. So my son and I went down to Kansas City and worked with some uh, chefs down there and, and came up with one that uh, is more of a brown sugar based sauce that's got some ghost pepper in it so it's got a sweetness and then a, a lot more heat at the end. But we did recognize that tastes were changing, especially among young people, where, where in um, they really like spicy foods. People have grown up eating a lot of Mexican food, uh, sushi with wasabi, just you know, much more different tastes than maybe, uh, you know, as, as Rich was alluding to earlier, the spaghetti meatballs and the mashed potatoes and gravy that probably most of us grew up with. It. It's very different now. So um, it's, it's um, worth it to uh, be cognizant of that and change if, if it looks like there's a need to change. Anybody else want to address that one? Well, Changing tastes? Well, I, I think um, portion sizes, people are eating less. And I do think people do want to eat healthier. Um, although, um, you said you met some guy who made that correlation between eating and eating healthier. A while ago, I think, you know, people are trying to eat healthier. Our, um, look, I know our portions, we used to have a two-pounder. We no longer have that. Like what's your face? We used to have a two pounder, we no longer have that. So, um, but, um, and people used to come in and eat that. One person used to come in and eat a two pounder. So, um, <laughs> nobody wants to do that anymore. <laughs> so, I have noticed that. But I think, I mean, just one thing I did want to say is that it, I think the one common thread that I keep hearing is that we, they are, we all um, have kept true to the like the original vision of our restaurants and you know some of, like the integrity of the original vision of our restaurant and i think although you know they have changed a little bit um not us but some of the restaurants have changed a little bit um that they have you know the, the original vision i think was strong enough that it has carried through i will add that um for fondue our competition being the melting pot which is a fondue uh, restaurant chain across the country with about 80 restaurants. I like to consider the circuses of fondue. They have multiple cheese fondues, 11 different chocolates, seven different cheeses. Whereas we have one, we've had one cheese, we've had one chocolate, we've had the same proteins and vegetables on our board over the years, and our sauces have basically remained the same until recent years. Um, we've held true. What we have done in recent years during our anniversary celebration, which is at the end of June, we celebrate 48 years, and everybody's invited. It's 48% off your food bill uh, <laughs> June 30th through July 4th. Is that a cheap flirt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not so it's not so cheap. 48% is a good plug. <laughs> Um, we have a, a recipe sauce contest. We have these diners that have come in, they're passionate about fondue and the sauces we have. We have a bunch of junior chefs out there on our mailing list, and they create sauces, they send them in, 
and if we pick your sauce, and it's, we feature it during that week, and if it is well received by our guests that are dining and our staff, we'll keep, we'll put your sauce on our tray and take an old sauce off. So that's how we do a little change every year. Okay. Um, I, I, since this is the Lincoln Park Community Research Initiative, I think we should talk about Lincoln Park a little bit and where your place in Lincoln Park is. And I'm curious why you decided to stay put. And there's opportunities to go elsewhere. Um, you know, years ago there was a Bub City in Lincoln Park. It closed. Now there's a Bub City in River North. Why not decamp? Go somewhere hotter, newer, safer? I don't know. I mean, 40 years ago, I can imagine there was this pocket of safety. And you wouldn't dare go to like Clybourne and Webster because it was no man's land. Uh, but you know, the city's changed. The city's grown. The city's gotten really dynamic. Why stay there? What was the neighborhood like so long ago? Um, I guess I, 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 I've been here for 25 years. Not, not as long as the restaurant has. Um, we we did move on to open other restaurants, but uh, John Bradley couldn't have built it. They couldn't build it. Is our original? is where I, I, I had my first opportunity to learn about the restaurant business. Uh, yes, the neighborhood has changed. There was a lot more rentals back then. Business was different back then. Now there's a lot of residentials. Still, a lot of the people that I met 25 years ago are still here. And their children are here. And their children have moved back to Lincoln Park. Most of them moved, moved away, went to college, came back. To keep uh, John Brothercon open, is uh, it's not only an honor, but it, it is it is something that motivates people to to keep us going. You know, they they I opened one far away in the suburbs, and they said, "Well, I haven't been, had a chance to go to Jump Valley, but I want to go back." And it's still there, and it's successful. I mean, we want to continue staying there. Uh, we welcome everyone there. But the the, the most the main part about uh, keeping that one open is the tradition, the, the tradition, and being part of the. For John Gayhaz and myself, um, John, well, it's been nice to watch Lincoln Park grow up and develop around all these restaurants <coughs> because hearing what the area was like, what Park West Theater was like, what the corner of Lincoln Avenue and Armitage was like back in the 70s to what this whole community is today. Um, really speaks to the businesses and the people that have led this community over the years developing it. So there really hasn't been a big reason to leave the community. It's, been, it's a wonderful community, Lincoln Park is, and to be part of it. 20 years ago when I joined John, it was his goal to do another Gayaz out in the burbs. Gayaz needed a lot of work to be done. We did the work. We started looking out in the suburbs. Came close to closing the deal on a location. Didn't work out. And John and I haven't revisited again. So John has another wine, another company, a wine of the month club, which keeps us busy. And the management team that I lead right now, we have a great quality of life. We are part of a very special restaurant. Every night is an experience, not just for the guests, but for us and for our staff with the different types of people that come in and the experiences, the stories that we have to say. So quality of life is probably the biggest reason why we haven't grown. And didn't Grunts almost close a couple years ago? There was outcry? Well, it did, yeah. Uh, my partners got together with me and they said, uh, Rich, Take a look at these other restaurants and take a look at what Grunts does. And it just wasn't making money. In fact, it was losing money for a while. There. And I hadn't paid attention to it too much, even though, without doubt, it's my favorite restaurant. Yeah. It's your baby. Yeah. yeah. If that didn't work, I don't think I'd have been in the restaurant business. And I literally thought I was going to fail. Um, it took about three months to catch on. And I had no money, no money, zero. And uh, I met my wife there. Our first son is named RJ. I started with my best friend. There's so many amazing memories. I ate there Sunday night with a group of people, old friends. And I literally have a memory in every booth that's in that restaurant. 
And so it's, I don't even remember what the hell the question was. But <laughs> <laughs> Every lane. No, it almost closed. What happened to us? Yes. And um, so my, thank you. So my, um, my partner said, Rich, you know, this is costing us money. And uh, I said, okay. I mean, they were really badgering me about it. I said, okay. So we announced it like three weeks before we were closing. And I literally was there every day. And it was like two days before we were ready to close, this couple came up to me and they said, you can't close it. You know, we met here. We, we come back and we celebrated. And I said, oh, they're right. I said, what the hell am I closing this for? <laughs> and I, you know, I can afford it if we lose money. And I said to my partners, I'll take all the losses personally. And it was really interesting because my son had started in the restaurant business working for other people, then he wanted to come with us. And I remember one day, he was working at a restaurant we had in the suburbs. And he came home, he was still living at home at the time, he was 23 years old or so. And I said, how did it go, Ar? And he said, oh, it was a slow night. I said, really? It was like a Wednesday night. And he said, and we had like a 45 minute wait. And I said, oh my God. He goes, that slow, this is a perfect spot for him to be a restaurant that's losing money. So he went in there along with our terrific, one of our terrific young partners. He was too inexperienced to do all this stuff. And I said, I'm gonna meet with you guys every day Every couple of days, and we're going to work on how you resuscitate this restaurant, how you make it fresh and fun and whatever. And we did it for about a year, and sure enough, it made a big difference. And uh, so, and we did have, I literally had, I'd say, three to four hundred letters and calls and people asking me, you know, why would I close it, and uh, hopefully I'll never close it. Yeah, it's like the birth of Burgoff. When they announced they were going to close, there was lines down the, down the block. Okay, one more question for each of you, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, this is a bit of a media question here, like the biggest, the worst, the greatest, but I'm curious about your biggest challenge over the lifespan of your experience in this restaurant. The biggest challenge you've had to face, was it you know, taxes, politics, customers, what, prices? What was the biggest challenge in terms of grunts for you? Well, I, I can tell you in general, I say this to the young partners all the time, and part of my job is mentoring the young people in our organization. There's only one major problem in the restaurant business that I see, and that's people coming through the door. <laughs> I'm telling you that I don't care if the food cost is high, I don't care if people don't show up, I don't if there's a recession, and there's a million things that, that happen. And the truth of the matter is, if you stay focused and think about the customer and cherish them, when they come through the door, I can fix anything. I can take any restaurant and fix it in a two, three month period of time. I've done that. We have a consulting company that's worked with some of the biggest and best companies in the country. So, and we've been doing it for like 17, 18 years. So I know how many restaurants we fix and what it takes. And I know how many of our restaurants that I fixed that got off track. And that's it. I mean, it's, I don't let our people give me any excuses. If you do it right, people come through the door. And that's the biggest problem. All right, Paul, what are you guys? Biggest challenge you had? Uh, biggest. Yeah, I would say it's possibly the, the same thing. It's just uh, remaining, <coughs> remaining focused. Um, I always think of the, the challenge with the, the restaurant as uh, my, my personal way of uh, describing it is the show must go on. And the staff and the, the ownership and, and obviously the management as well, it's really important that they have that attitude. That, uh, um, and if that if that attitude doesn't exist, things can fall apart pretty quickly. You know, if, uh, if the, the cook gets into a car accident on the way to work, and Paul Tuesday has to throw on an apron and start making ribs, 
you better be prepared to do that or things will be on the wheels are going to come off. That ever happened? Sure. Okay. Maybe not specifically in the battery accident, but yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so the, that's, that is probably the biggest challenge though, it's just, uh, it's, it's a it's a very different industry from uh, from most night obviously from most nine to five jobs. Especially in our case, we're only closed five days a year. Uh, that means 360 days there has to be a staff and and there has to be product. And everything has to be ready to go, and that's that's a big commitment. That's just a, and it's an ongoing challenge. It's not like you know being struck by lightning or a single individual incident. So. Jeff, what about you quickly? Big challenge. I would agree with that. It's, I mean, I've said to the staff lately, taking the same restaurant, the same number of tables, same number of seats, same four walls, and taking it to the next level every year, meaning the experience to the guests, the top guest counts, sales, bottom line profits, everything that happens in between, it is a challenge to go to that next level. And it is, I worked harder this year than I did 20 years ago to keep things going in a wonderful fashion. So. Kathy? Um, yeah, I would have to agree. I, I said to Paul earlier, I said, I'm surprised we've never met each other. Said, well, that's because we're probably both working so hard. <laughs> and it's true, it's not something you set up and then leave, okay, I, I fixed it, I, this is the idea. You have to be there every day, you have to tend to it every day. And you have to have respect for the loyalty, the loyalty of your staff. I mean, we have the same guy making our sauce. Um, Martin back there has been with our restaurant for over 20 years. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, and loyalty of our customers. And um, respecting that fact that, you know, they, they, they really, um, they really um, do come for the consistency and that, that the only way that you're able to do that is if you do tend to it every, every day. Every day you've got to wake up and to, you know, and really, well, you have to enjoy what you're doing and you have to do it every day. It's not something you can leave. Sam, you concur? Boy, I'm going to throw everybody off at this one. Um, I tell you what, uh, the biggest challenge in our industry no, not in the industry, for the barley corn, corn, for you guys. For barley corn, it's been a lot of the, the, the uh, protecting our industry because I mean, barley corn is part of the industry and it is important to know that it's protecting all the new laws that has passed. So I want to spend a lot of time, more time in my restaurant, but in reality, the truth is, is we spend a lot of time researching, developing, and in politics, trying to make sure that the, the laws that they pass are fair to the business owners, fair to the community, and they're easy, easy for the ultimate to manage. Okay, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, doing legislations. Uh, we spend a lot of time. Uh, we've created a program called uh, uh, there, which I mean, not there, uh, to start children, uh, college students from over drinking minors. So we protect our industry. And Barley Corn has been a leader, and and I, and I have to say that because it, it is one of my biggest challenge. The restaurant to me, I mean, I have a great team. My daughter helped me out. I mean, my daughter's been in the restaurant, the restaurant since they were three years old with eight minutes and five years old since they were eight minutes, trying to serve, serve our customers. So it, it's, my biggest challenge is really the, the protecting the new legislation to protect our industry and our community. I'm guessing you probably memorized your attorney's cell phone number by now. Oh, uh, by the way. Okay, let's open up for questions. Uh, we've got lots of time and uh, we're up here for you. So any questions about Anything. There's two microphones up here in the middle of the aisle. Just feel free to walk up there and say who you are and where you're from. What's your question? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, my name is Chuck Sorry. And if you could put kind of go as close as you can to the microphone. Okay. Uh, lived in the area since probably the 1950s. Uh, question is, what? How did the name Paya come into existence? Um, John had a partner, and it was Jerry. So they had the G and they had the J and they put a couple of vowels in between. <laughs> and, uh, back in the 60s, whatever they did to come up with the legend of Prince Chaos. <laughs> Good job. Well, if anybody asks me for a romantic place to have an evening, uh, it's my first recommendation. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's a gentleman behind you first. Sorry. Well, I have two things. I have a comment to make and a question to ask. Or, no, they're, they're both comments. Okay. The first comment was I moved here in 1966 when they described people how things were. The things that I always highlight was number one, that uh, I moved into one of the first rehab large buildings in the neighborhood. It was at 2224 North Orchard. It, it, was, it was a big house that was converted to seven apartments. And the construction wasn't super duper, so it didn't take long before it got torn down. So that's a landmark that I live in that's not there anymore. But the neighborhood was, uh, there were uh, a family a few doors south of us that were raising chickens. And every once in a while, a chicken would flow the coop, flow the coop, flow the coop, flow the coop or fly the coop with everyone. Most of the times it were the roosters, but once in a while, the chicken. And walking up and down the alley. It was real easy. There was only one family doing it, so that's where you took it. But the most unbelievable thing that people don't believe is uh, I had parking and I had a garage behind the apartment building. The problem was the garage was small and my car was big. Uh, so if I didn't want to wrestle, it was easier for me to park in front of the building than it was to park in the garage. So I spent more days outside than I did inside. Except when they had the big storm in 67. I couldn't get into the garage, so it was, it was a thunderstorm for about a week. Are we getting to a question, or are we? <laughs> no, no. I just want to make sure, because we have questions, I just want to make sure. Okay, no, there's just one more comment. Okay. I want to say i relative to John Harleycourt, because we really enjoyed the slides. And I always criticize the slides. It would be a great uh, parlor game if you would identify what each slide was. And that's a, and, uh, but it looked like it wasn't necessary, because it lasted another 25 years. After I first saw it. Okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming. My name is Maxine here. I've been living in um, Old Town and this area since 1973 and have been a patron of all of your restaurants. I'm curious as to um, find out what you think about the um, influx of uh, uh, food cart, uh, food trucks, and I really don't feel it affects your business per se in this area, but how do you feel about it in general? The question was, what do you think about uh, the influx of food carts or food trucks in Chicago? Does it affect you at all? I'm, I'm going to answer that for you, but I think, I think that the alderman and the mayor did a great job uh, uh, placing safe zones for uh, the brick and mortar buildings. Uh, I really believe that everybody deserves an opportunity. I mean, uh, they're all over the country. There, there's no stopping at home. Uh, so it's good to welcome them with uh, with legislation like I was saying and the rules where they could be and not be and uh, and the only thing that I wish is that they're not there after two o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> sorry, everyone can go home and go to sleep. Anybody else have an opinion about food carts or food trucks? No. Okay. No other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, just, go, just go ahead and walk up to the microphone. And if you can, folks, just put your mouth as close as you can to the mic. Otherwise, when you're this far away, it's hard to get. Uh, hi. Um, Ron Rennick. Been to all your places. Uh, and you must have a thousand years worth of experience sitting up here. And I'm wondering, is there anything in this industry that caught you totally off guard? You had no idea. You couldn't see it coming. But it really taught you something. <laughs> Larry Levy told me once that he's never, he's never made any mistakes, just expensive lessons. So, any curveballs for any of you? Uh, the only thing that caught me off guard was my daughters having a drink with me at the bar. I never thought it was going to happen. <laughs> 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 that, that, like, wow. <laughs> I thought I'd be out of the business before, but I guess that's the, that's the word to go now. Well, I think there's constant challenges in life, as well as business. And, uh, you know, you have a lot of restaurants. It's like having a lot of, I, I view them as kids. And there's always somebody that has a cold. And, um, you know, I think after a while, they're not so new. The people are new that present the problems, or the restaurants are new that present the problems. But it's just sort of part of it. I, I think it's um, the mindset that leaders have to have as to how you handle problems. 
you know, some people get sick and they fall apart. And some people get sick and they stay strong. They believe. And so I think a lot of it has to do with your mindset. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to learn how to take punches. Nobody gets successful in business or life without getting smacked in the face every once in a while. And you live with it. And you go on. And you need to have a short memory. <laughs> you know, I, I, okay, like everybody, I, I have my moments where I'm depressed. And I always say, if I'm depressed more than a day, there's something wrong with me. That's just me. I have a very short memory. Bad in some, my wife will tell you that's bad. And, and uh, but in terms of business, it's good. I, I think what caught me by surprise um, is how important you become to um, the families that come to your restaurant. I mean, I, I don't, I can't tell you how many people say they have our menu framed in their hallway, or in, and um, it just that always surprises me. We get, we get Christmas cards from customers and how important we are to them, and how how we've become so much part of their traditions and their their lives. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well. Well, my name is Evan Elman. I'm with Elman, and I've lived in this area for my whole adult life. And I've always been within a two to three minute walk from John Barley Penn. My question is not for the panel, but it's for the audience. And I wonder, for the show of hands, how many people here would like to see John Barley Corn resume? Classical music. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I make a promise. I make a promise because I've been arguing with my manager all the time. Classical lights. Classical, you know, every Tuesday or something, right? Uh, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday morning. Sunday, Sunday morning for brunch. I said that you come in this Sunday, and Sunday morning for brunch we'll have classical music. And we'll start it from 11 to 3 o'clock. There we go. Okay? Uh, on the record, every Sunday.
Well, you're not giving it back if they tip more than 20%, so I don't want to hear you complaining if they tip under 20%. And generally speaking, I, uh, if I have a server that keeps having those problems, I wonder about the server. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've said this to the staff because there are times where guests will not leave a tip, leave a small tip, and it can happen naturally. Some people, they go out, they have a great time, they're not paying attention when they try to sign their charge slip, and they leave without leaving a tip, and that happens. There are tip, poor tippers out there at times, and there are great tippers out there. Well, um, what is frustrating for Gayhaz, we do a lot of direct marketing and, and discount um, is, is available for guests to use, is that people are tipping on the discounted amount and on a more consistent basis than ever before versus the pre-discounted counted amount. So, this might be insightful for you. A lot of people that have jobs get paid every two weeks. They live for that two week period of time and you get your paycheck and you do what you have to do. Entrepreneurs, more often, think in terms of a year. You know, you want to know what you're doing every month, but what you've done at the end of the year is what matters. Many, many times, servers think of their life in terms of what they make that day. I don't know why. They, they, well, if I make $200 today, I'll be able to pay my rent. And they make $130 and they're really bummed out. And it's just sort of the nature of the business. I'm not sure why bartenders and servers often think on a day-to-day -day basis. And I explain it to our management people so they'll better understand what they're dealing with. It's an interesting perspective. Yep. Hi, I'm Jerry Packer. I moved uh, to Chicago in Lincoln Park in 1975, and my two favorite watering holes were Mel Markins and R.J. Grunts. I was a lot younger back then, so I could appreciate those kinds of places. Um, and I watched my beloved Eagles, Philadelphia Eagles, lose on a regular basis at John Barley Point. So maybe. <laughs> I have some uh, mixed feelings about barley corns. Hopefully, this <laughs> evening will be a little better. Um, I've eaten in all of the facilities, and, and they're all great. And I've eaten at almost all of Rich's uh, properties. I shouldn't weigh about 400 pounds, but fortunately, I have a high metabolism. You've had some phenomenal concepts over the years running the gamut from high-end to, to, uh, uh, to casual. And I was wondering if you had any one concept that really fell flat, that really was a, uh, for you, a disaster uh, relative to the successes you've had with your other properties. I had so many disasters, but I can tell you, I, I can tell you one that was really a joke. I might be one of the few guys that took a pizza concept that was really quite good in Vegas and screwed it up. And I'll tell you the story. So someone offers me an opportunity to be in a hotel on a top floor right outside the world's tallest roller coaster. This is going back, I don't know, 20 years, 15 years built this hotel, sort of the north end of Vegas. And I said, wow, this could be great. It's going to draw big crowds. And we did this, what I thought was really a spectacular pizza thing. And uh, we were, had a, a part of the concept where you could throw the pizza. So there, there was a whole bunch of things. But besides, it was good. Well, what I quickly found out is when people came up and there were lines, there were lines block long. Nobody wanted to eat pizza because they thought they'd get sick <laughs> before they got on the Ferris wheel. And when 
they got off, they must have been sick <laughs> because they walked past us again. <laughs> and I never, I mean, it was like, I rarely strike out. I'll hit singles that I can turn into doubles or triples. But this one was a disaster. <laughs> and I said after about seven or eight months to my partner was running it, Daddy, you know, let's get the hell out of here. I mean, I'll take the loss. It's not going to change. We tried a lot of different things. <clears throat> so sometimes you think you're smart and you're not. <clears throat> yeah, that's only one of many mistakes that I made. Hi, I'm uh, Michelle Smith. And just one of the long line of aldermen who've been in Lincoln Park and watched you grow. And I have to say, I know you guys are in the food business, but you know you're really in the memory business. Uh, when I moved to Lincoln Park in 1979, I was 23, so I guess you did that. And went to all your places and loved them. And went to a few places, actually, when I was even a little younger visiting, and I couldn't drink in some places at that time. But the reason you have such a wonderful turnout today is because of all the wonderful food you've served us, and on top of that, or as part of that, the wonderful memories that you've brought of great dates, really romantic dates occasions, really fun evenings at grunts, getting those chips, and seeing those great pictures of all the waitresses on the walls that seem to be, I don't know if they're still the same gals, but they all look fabulous. The wonderful times at Barley Corn, the great ribs and burgers at, uh, at, uh, at Put Acres, and those fabulous pizzas, which we all, you know, you're young, you got to just go to Pizza on Brighter. So I just really want to say thank you, really, thank you from Lincoln, from Lincoln Park, because without you, we really wouldn't be the community we are today. You helped stabilize the neighborhood, keep people here, keep people living here, and, and I think we're all really, really grateful. And I just want to say thank you. I think that is a perfect way to end the program. I don't see anybody else asking questions. If there's anybody else, I don't want to stop anybody, but that's a great way to end the program. Thank you for saying that. And uh, if I want to say a couple of things before we wrap up, okay. That was a perfect way, Alderman Smith, to end the program. We thank you so much. I don't know about you, but I, I knew I would be fascinated by what you all had to say. I didn't realize I was going to be as touched as I was by your, your sense of serving and your dedication to what you do. And your stories are wonderful. So thank you, Paul Tuzzi. Thank you, Rich Melman. Thank you, Jeff Lawler. Thank you, Kathy Galenas. And thank you, Sam Sanchez. And thank you, Steve Delinsky. <laughs> First of all, I was instructed to say that if anybody parked in our Sheffield garage, there are little tickets out there on the table for the special parking rates. <laughs> Secondly, um, these programs don't happen by themselves. So the first two people that I have to thank, one is Julie M. who works with us, and one is Shauna Smith who will never come inside, but she kills herself working. And these two women uh, are part of our team in community and government relations, and they are terrific. So I, I want to thank them publicly. And I want to thank our research initiative committee members, who we sit around and we brainstorm and we come up with ideas for topics and who to be invited. And, and this program and all of you are a result of their brainstorming. So all of the committee members who are here, I would so love it if you would stand up so people can show their appreciation to you. So don't be shy, stand up. I have to say that they were very instrumental in contacting many of you. Uh, Kelly Mead had the great idea of, of setting a table like it is in your restaurants and bringing all your memorabilia and I know you have all enjoyed that. So as I always say, um, we're not throwing you out, but please feel free to continue the conversation informally, but the final part of our program is over. And thank you so much, and we'll see you again in the fall.